Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. I got more comebacks than Elvis now. <laughs> Sheesh. Somebody asked me how did I feel when I was lying there on the floor of the atrium. I said, you know, one of the thoughts that came to my mind is the first time in my life I wish I were a, pa a Pentecostal pastor because I would get credit for being slain in the Holy Ghost at least. <laughs> it's uh, been quite a couple of weeks, a couple of months, a couple of decades, a couple of everything. But uh, I, uh, I'm learning a new reality right now. So pray for me this week. So I'll finally get into my cardiologist this week. I've obviously had the initial testing with the cardiologist at the hospital, et cetera. But hopefully we'll find something out this week. For those of you who are new today, uh, I, I uh, just a couple weeks ago I collapsed out in the atrium. So that's what the, all the hubbub is about. So um, thank you for your prayers. I, I appreciate it. Very, very much. Um, all my life I've been a pusher, push through, push through, push through. And uh, Olivia Albright gave me a book a few months ago by a, a Christian psychiatrist by the name of Andy Kolber. And the book is titled Try Softer. <laughs> and I'm trying softer. <laughs> and it's not natural to me. Um, when I was about fourth grade, part of the recovery that I've been going through is I remember distinctly in about fourth grade, you know, so I, you guys, some of you know my story. My dad was this six foot three inch, 220 pound linebacker. And um, I took my, my mom's side of the jeans. And so I remember about fourth or fifth grade, I started playing basketball and, and uh, I remember just getting applauded for my hustle and my grit and my competitiveness. And when I was doing some analysis this year, that, that, that idea that the only way I can measure up is if I overfunction. It's the only way I'm worth anything is if I overfunction. And it certainly wasn't just that. But as we talk about this subject matter today, uh, you may think that this is esoteric talk about the law of God, and, but it really is, in essence, the gospel is about, is about the reality that you'll never measure up. You'll never measure up. But he measured for you, right? So here's the hook today. Here's, here's the, the verse that is the hook Romans 7, 6, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. This is the new way of a relationship with Christ versus the old way of religion that is about making sure you measure up, making sure you do your fulfillment. Now, some of you know that we're, we're venturing into something I've never heard of a church do, and that is we're continuing our Roman series, but we're intersecting it with Christmas. And as I was thinking about this this week, the, the, Christmas is a great time, actually, to be thinking about the book of Romans because Christmas is the season of the law. It is. If you think about it, see, Christmas, more than any other time of year, is the season of be good enough all I have to do is say these words. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why Santa Claus, the judge of the law, is coming to town. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to find out. If you've been naughty or nice, the judge of the law is coming to town. And then there's these words. He sees you when you're sleeping. There's, he's never not looking. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good for so be good for goodness sake. And so we, we all know those words. And what we really, we fail to recognize with those words is they're just classic behavioral modification words, right? As a matter of fact, when those words didn't work anymore, we gave Santa some help with an elf on the shelf. You never know where he's going to be. And this is all a classic parent move to, to modify behavior. 
Because parents know that you've got to keep that power of FOMO, the fear of missing out, in your pocket or else you lose all leverage. Now, what obviously I'm saying this tongue-in-cheek, but in all seriousness, that's what religion in and of itself will do to you. In and of itself, religion is an end in of itself. Just do religious things, hoping that the, the, that, that the 51% that's on your good side of the list, it, it outweighs the 49% that's on the bad side of the list. And so religion in and of itself is really all about the power of the law. It's about the power of the law to put you, put me, on the naughty list if we don't behave right. And for many of you who have grown up, and, as you, and you know this, most people have a Santa Claus theology when it comes to God. I mean, I know some of you are going, wait a minute, isn't that what it's about? Is like the good outweighs the bad? It's, it's totally not about that. That's, that's why we're here. Is the gospel is not about that at all. It's about the fact that, that you don't want to see your list. It's that bad. You are more core sinful than you would ever dare imagine, but the gospel says you are more at your core love than you could ever hope. And look at this. The, the, cool thing about, the cool thing about the scriptures is that you see the gospel everywhere. So let me show you something here. That, that Here's the gospel. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, again, we can't appreciate one word that is stamped over that statement, scandal. It's horrific public shame. And the law said, if indeed she was proven she had committed adultery, penalty, severe penalty. That's, that's what it's saying. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. You ever skip over that? Here's this man whose conscience was tuned to the law of God, the Pentateuch. And yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. So Joseph had this sense of truth and sense of grace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, you know the rest of the story, don't you? The rest of the story is an angel tells him, Joseph, take her to be yours. They go, and she gives birth. After he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. People say, there's, that's one of the reasons I don't believe in Christianity is there's no way you can believe in a virgin birth. No way. There's no way. When in fact, we, we now literally know that a virgin can give birth. Artificial insemination. Literally, it's not impossible for a virgin to give birth. And if God created us, he knew about that long before we did, didn't he? If you believe Genesis 1-1, then you, the rest of the Bible is very possible. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Yeshua. The Greek is Jesus. The Hebrew is Yeshua, which means the Lord saves because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through, Eli, or through Isaiah. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. There you see his honor and his virtue, and he gave him the name Jesus. You see this man who is surrendering to, to, to him, himself even beyond the law. You see, Joseph did something better than fulfill just the letter of the law and stop there. If he'd have done that, the letter of the law is he would have disgraced Mary. He was within his rights to do that, but he fulfilled the law with grace and mercy. You see, Joseph was the type of the very Christ that he was going to father. The redemptive history begins to culminate with the fulfillment of the law in the body of this little baby. And it starts with the faithfulness of this man, Joseph. It starts with him. 
He died to the law for the sake of fulfilling and perfecting the intent of the law. Notice what Joseph does. He covers the shame of Mary. He provides for Mary. He protects Mary. He takes care of Mary. He gives her a new dignity. That's the gospel. That's what Jesus does for you. Jesus covers your shame. He protects you. He provides for you. And the word Joseph, the name Joseph, actually means God will add to. God used Joseph to care for Mary, to envelop Mary, and then God would add to Mary by adding you and adding me through his son Jesus. This is the gospel. The gospel is not this. Here's, here's how, if you have a Santa Claus theology, you read passages like this, you know, you sit down, I'm going to read my Bible, I'm going to learn how to be a better person. And you read that and you go, okay, I should be a man like Joseph. I'm going to try really hard to be the kind of man Joseph is. You might have heard that already. Okay, I'm going to try really hard to be a person of truth and grace. And I'm going to fulfill that. And the problem with that is, is the gospel constantly says, guess what? You will fail doing that. If your merit, if your measuring up is you're going to do this really well because you know how to try harder. You know how to apply yourself. There are parts of you that really aren't worthy of God, and so you're going to do those on your own. And the gospel is not, read that, try to be like Joseph. The gospel is this. Listen, listen, listen to this. The gospel is, you need a better Joseph. And guess what his name is? His name is Jesus. Because you can't fulfill this on your own. Jesus is the true and better Joseph who fulfills the law, covers our shame, gives us a new dignity, adds to Mary. Look at these words. Through Jesus, God fulfilled the law perfectly for us so that we are free from the penalty of not fulfilling the law perfectly. That's why we live for Christ and not the law. Put another way, that's why Southbrook's mission is to, to connect people to Christ, not what? Religion. How many of you, don't have to raise your hand, you're here because you got tired of religion. It wore you out. And it might have not been a, a, a conscious thing that you were consciously aware of inadequacy and not measuring up, but unconsciously, that guilt just drove you away from God. Like, I, I can't win this game. You know, it's like, number one reason why teenagers quit things is then they realize, I can't win this game. I can't, I can't, I can't please anyone. I'm in a double bind. I do this, I'm wrong. And, and it's why people give up on God is, I can't win this game. That's right. And let me show you something. Because this, this is thick stuff. This is thick stuff. But I want you to see this now where we are in Romans 7. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law. What died? What does that mean? That it doesn't matter anymore? No, that's not what that's not what makes us tick anymore. Through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, and and this is what the law does. You're going to see this in a minute. What the law does, it actually instigates our desires. It does. You'll see this in a minute. The sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. In other words, how many of you have ever sinned so much you realize you might as well sin some more? You might as well just go the whole way. You just might as well, I mean, you've messed up now. I mean, you know you've done that. You know you have. But now by dying to what once bound us, how many of you quit God for a while because you realize, man, I just can't win this? We quit to that, though. We've been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, not on the old way of the written code. What should we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Think about that. That is so apropos to our culture. I am a, I am a believer in Christian capitalism. I really believe in it's the best way. But think about what capitalism will do if it's just capitalism and not Christian. It'll turn coveting into a virtue. It's what it'll do. If we don't have the law, hey man, that's what makes capitalism have such a bad name in the world. Is we'll turn that which is nasty into something that's virtuous. If it isn't infused with the truth and grace of Christ. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. 
Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and died. Well, I'm going to break this down in a minute. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. There was a time in your life when, when your relationship with God was dead because you couldn't, you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Now remember, he is writing, he is writing to Jewish Christians who had the law. And they were asking the question, so, so, so if in Christ grace is what now reigns, what's the point of the law? Where does the law fit in? Has anybody ever had that question? It's like, where does this fit now? Is it, it's all grace, there is no, I mean, there's no right or wrong, because it's all, no. First of all, the law of God was necessary. This is really important that in a pluralistic, relativistic culture like ours, where the presidents of Harvard, Penn, and MIT can't even ask us, answer a simple question. Can't even, but why? you know what all that was about? It's about relativism. We can't really say that it's wrong to say that because we might offend that. No, that's wrong. And, and so that, the law's necessary. Humanity needed the practical guidance of the law of God. We needed transcendent moral guardrails that would keep us from going in the ditch. Which, how many of you know that your, your front end is out of alignment, and without those guardrails, you will go into a ditch so fast? How many of you have ever been on I-75, and they have these persnickety laws? You can't go southbound in a northbound lane. You can't go beyond a certain speed limit. You know, they give you five, you take two more, but you can't go beyond. You, you, you got a signal when you change. They have all these laws. What do we call I, Interstate 75? We call it a freeway. Because we're only free when we all cooperate with the law. When we transgress that, that's when crashes start happening. As a matter of fact, one of the ways you know you have received the heart of Christ, you have the spirit of Christ, and you're not living just according to the written code, is this. Listen, is you do not look for ways to go around God's law. You don't look for ways, you know, W.C. Fields once said, I'm looking for loopholes. When somebody caught him reading the Bible one time, I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> the law is the way you say, this, is, this tells me how I please my father. There's a new law in Ohio that you cannot text and drive. Everybody seen that? It's really dangerous to do that. But if you love people and the thought that you could hurt someone, like, like you could literally hit a kid on a bicycle because you weren't paying attention, uh, you don't need that law. You don't need that law. You keep the spirit of that law and the letter of it, but it's not because you might get penalized if a law enforcement officer sees you looking at your phone. No, 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 no. You don't text and drive because you love. That's, it's a different level. Now, let's say you're answering emails or you're scrolling through Instagram on your phone while driving. You're pulled over and you say, officer, I really didn't break the letter of the law. I wasn't texting. I was answering emails. I was, I was answering emails. I was scrolling my Instagram. You wouldn't do that because, you know, that's, that's, oh, that's ridiculous. That letter of the law type parsing. No, if you love people and the thought of carelessly, needlessly injuring someone occurs to you, you don't drive distracted. And this is the gospel. Look at these words from what John said. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. You begin to see that's the way that I align myself with how God made the world, how God made the universe, how I please my heavenly Father. So the law was necessary. Secondly, the law of God, look at this. Many of us don't know this. The law of God was meant to accuse. It was actually designed as a Wow, I don't measure up. The law was not given to make us moral. That's why you'll never see me saying, put the Ten Commandments on the courthouse steps. We can do that, but that's missing the point of the law. The law was not given to make us better. The law was given as a measuring to show you don't measure up. You better hope there's a plan B because plan A isn't working for you. 
And if you compare yourself to other people, you might come out pretty average or even good. But when you compare yourself to the perfect law of God, you say, is there a plan B? Even the great apostle Paul in Philippians 3, 9 said, when I compare myself to the perfect law of God, I'm unrighteous. Every few years, I do this exercise to show this, and it's been a long time since I've done it, so I'm sure a number of you have never done this. But every few years, I, I list the Ten Commandments, and then what I want you to do while I'm doing this, I want you to keep in your mind how many you've never broken. You've just kept this one, okay? Now, if you're under 12, you can't do this because you just don't count yet, okay? You don't count yet. All right, so I'm going to go through this. So keep, keep, keep the list of the ones you've never broken. Uh, first, have no other gods before me. If you've always put God first in your life, in everything you've done, count that as one you've never broken. How many of you are already in trouble? This is not going well. Number two, do not make any graven image. If you've never fashioned an idol and bowed down and worshipped it, you count that as one you've never broken. Aren't you glad that one's in there? Because we've all got one. We've all got one, I think, that we've never literally, literally broken. Number three, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. If you've never used the name of God, the name of Jesus Christ, flippantly in vain, and, and if you've never worshipped without really thinking about what you were doing, then you count that as one you've never broken. Number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We, for us in this era, that's the Lord's day. So if you have always observed corporate worship in a way that you know is honoring to God, you've never skipped church to go to a Bengals game, you've never, you've, you, I mean, you know, to, to stay home and cook the meal because the preacher is coming over. I always thought that was so ironic. That Mary stayed home to make the meal for the preacher coming. I was like, that just kind of missing the point there, I think. But you, you count that as one you've never broken. Never skip church. Never, never, never fail to honor God. Number five, honor your parents. If from the time you were a little child, you never sassed your parents. You never gave a look. You always did what they told you. You always respected them. Count that as one you've never broken. Number six, you shall not kill if you have never murdered anybody in cold blood. Now, the New Testament, Jesus said that if you hate somebody in your heart, that's the same thing as committing murder. But for just this exercise, we won't count it that way, no. If you have literally never murdered anyone, you count that as one you've never broken. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. If you have always been faithful to your mate, you've never been unfaithful to your mate, count that as one you've never broken. Now, the New Testament says that if you lust after someone in your heart, that's the same thing as committing adultery. But just for the sake of this exercise, we're not going to count it that way. Literally, if you've never literally committed adultery, then you count that as one you've never broken. Number eight, you shall not steal. If you have never stolen a dime out of your mother's purse, a towel out of a hotel room, a, a golf ball, a Titleist Pro B1 off the driving range, not an answer off somebody else's paper. You count that as one you've never broken, okay? Number nine, you shall not lie. If you've never told a lie to get out of a situation, if you've never exaggerated a story for effect, if you've never flattered anybody to get their approval or acceptance, then you count that as one you've never broken. Number 10, you shall not covet. If you've never wished you had something that someone else had or somebody that someone else had, then you count that as one you've never broken. Okay, everybody got their, their amount? <laughs> How many of you have kept all 10? Raise your hand if you've kept all 10. Again, if you put your hand up, you're breaking one of them right now. <laughs> Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. This is a corrupt group of people. I'm telling you, man. You people need to be in church. I'm telling you right now. Yeah. So we go by our standards today. Just no New Testament qualifiers, just the Old Testament. I figure I've kept three. I've never made a graven image, and the other two are none of your business. I'm not telling you which ones <laughs> are the other two. Look at this. Look at this. Romans 3.20. Therefore, no one, not Mother Teresa, not Billy Graham, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. We have a virus 
It's infected us. And I love the way the Phillips translation translates that. It's the straight edge of the law that shows us how crooked we are. God did not give us the Ten Commandments. He didn't give us the law to make us better. He gave them so we would say with Paul, not having a righteousness from our, of our own by observing the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, his righteousness given to us as a gift. And that when we're infused with that, we don't need a law that says don't commit adultery. We don't need a law that says don't steal. We don't need a law that says don't lie. Why? Because we love now. We have a higher law. And the Santa Claus theology that he's evalu- God is evaluating who's naughty and nice, and you just hope you come in at 51% on the good side, There's a whole letter in the New Testament written to to oppose that. It's called the book of Galatians. And and it says that that theology is an anathema. It's not the gospel. The gospel is nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to that cross I cling. My only hope is that you have given me the gift of your righteousness by faith. And... You know, Romans 3.10 says, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. And doesn't that what it feels like? When you were living with this old theology of, oh gosh, I just gave up on God. Most people talk about they don't believe in God because of this, this, and this. Most of the time it's because I just gave up because I just couldn't win that game. Didn't you feel like you were under a curse? That that life feels cursed. And all who are who are under the law are under a curse. Cursed are everyone who does not continue to do most things written in the book of the law. Is that what it says? Everything written in the book of the law. James said in James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. That for all of us who think, I'm a pretty good person, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna get into heaven because I'm a pretty good person, you gotta keep the whole law because if you stumble at just one point, you're a lawbreaker. You're a lawbreaker now. Let's say on the way home from church today, you get pulled over for going way over the speed limit. I guarantee you what you're not going to do is this. But officer, I haven't murdered anybody today. I haven't stolen from anyone today. I haven't coveted anything today. What, if you said that, what would the officer say? The officer would say, I don't care how, what you haven't done. You're a lawbreaker. Now you have to atone for not fulfilling the law. There has to be payment. Somebody has to absorb that you didn't fulfill the law. And if you get that, you understand why the law was necessary and why the law was accusatory because we're, we see that I can't pay the fine. I can't pay the debt. I can't pay that. And it's not about what I haven't done that's bad it's I'm a lawbreaker. If I'm hanging by a cliff with a 10-link chain, how many of those links have to break when I fall, for me to fall? How many? All 10? Just one. And this is the gospel of Christ. The gospel shows us that the law was meant to be accusatory. Look at this one. This one really gets you. Because if you were reading this in Romans 7, you, you're like, what? The law of God was meant to be incendiary. It was meant to show not just how we don't measure up, it was meant to reveal what our nature is like. The law actually inflames our desires. Now, any of you who have kids know this to be true. I remember one time we were, I was playing with our kids on our floor when they were little, and Sherry comes out into the living room there at our house on Willowhurst, and she says, hey, don't let Jordan and Austin go into Austin's room. I just fin- fin- finished painting the walls, and they're still wet. Those words weren't out of her mouth, and Austin was up and going to his room to touch the walls. And if you know that, you know that's how we're wired. We are wired in such a way. You ever heard a mom say to her child, whatever you do, don't stick those beans up your nose. And the child hadn't thought of that one. And then the law was inflamed. Hadn't thought of that one. We see this all the time. There's something about human nature that if you tell us don't do that, what do we want to do? That. A number of years ago, Christianity Today had an article that said that they had done a comprehensive examination of the Bible and found that there are 623 different sins in the Bible. And they said the majority of emails following that issue were people wanting the list because they were afraid they were missing out on, on, on some sins that they had missed. 
And, and this is human nature. The law doesn't control sin. It actually stimulates it. So that's why, for those of you who tried to live in religion and tried to live the Santa Claus theology, you look back and you go, I got worse. Yep. For example, we know this one. Do not take my name in vain. There are thousands of names you could use if you're startled by someone all of a sudden. Uh, but you don't say, Julius Caesar, don't do that to me, do you? I mean, there are hundreds of names. If you hit your nail, your, you know, your thumb with a, you're nailing a nail and you hit your thumb with a hammer, you, you could say, Jimmy Carter. But you don't say that. Why is it the name of Jesus Christ? Because there's something in us that the prohibition actually stimulates our desire. Human nature, it doesn't just accuse us, it actually inflames in us. The desire to rebel, sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produces in me every kind of covetous desire, for apart from the law, sin is dead. And if you hear that and you go, boy, I feel defeated. I'm sorry, I came to church today to hear all this bad news. I got good news. Because the last thing I want you to see is the whole point of the New Testament, that the law of God was designed to be transitory. It was meant to take us somewhere. So what does Christmas do? Christmas takes us, the whole world, to the Christ. All, for a month, our whole world is taken to Christ. The law is like Christmas. It was designed to take us to Christ. Matter of fact, one of my favorite words, and I use this mostly with our college players, box kids, but I use this word in Galatians 3 and 4. Paul says the law was our tutor to get us to the master teacher. And, and the word is pedagogos. The law was our tutor. Our, you know, then that day, wealthy families would have uh, chauffeurs that were tutors who would make sure the child was taken to school. And Paul said the law of God was, was our pedagogos to make sure that we go, oh, because I realize that I'm not going to ever be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law, I found Christ. Because I felt cursed, and someone's now explained that to me. It wasn't just me. Everybody feels that way who's trying to measure up. That now I've found Christ. And this is the end game of religion. Religion in and of itself is simply, it is simply a Santa Claus theology. But when you see the law of God as going somewhere, the somewhere is the Christ. The law was added, Romans 5.20, so that sin might increase. For where sin increases, grace increased all the more. This is the scandal of Christ, friends. I'm telling you, is what does God do when you had a period in your life when he, you took advantage of his grace? He gives you more grace. I know. It's, it's, it's scandalous. Uh, here's a, here's a, this is just one way to look at it. Okay, let's say this. Let's say that um, tonight you hear this on the news. And hopefully this will explain the whole book of Romans to you. 29 teenagers have been charged with trashing a house during a wild three-day party while the family was away on vacation. When the Haynes family returned home, they discovered thousands of dollars in damages. A recording of the home showed drug paraphernalia, beer bottles, broken furniture, walls, damage to the carpeting. The offenders also stole money, jewelry, and firearms, drove the family's cars. The damage was done over the course of three days. Local police say a teenage friend of the family knew the access code to get into the house, and police say he then invited nearly 100 people to his party. Now, take that scenario, and you find out that this boy who accessed the home of the Haynes family was from a very troubled family. So the reason he had a relationship is the Haynes mother and father let that boy stay with them a lot. He slept at their house. He ate a lot of meals with them. The mom drove him to school every day. But when this family that had taken him away was on vacation, the boy invited nearly 100 people to his parties, and together they trashed the house. And let's say your mom and dad Haynes. You love this kid who did this. 
you've come home to this trashed house, you know he's the only one who had access. You now have a decision to make. And here is the gospel in a nutshell. You have, you have three options. Three options. This is it. You can give him justice. That's one option. And justice is, is whenever you give someone what the law says they deserve. And so you have the option to treat him with justice. You give him exactly what he deserves. So you might say to that kid, you say, you fouled up, son. I'm going to treat you with justice. And so we're going to call the police. The police are going to come. You're going to get arrested. You're going to go to be charged with destroying private property. And then I'm, I'm going to take you to my house, and I'm going to show you the damage you did, and you're going to pay. Now, listen, if you treated that kid with justice, you are not a bad person because you're simply giving him what he deserves. No more, no less. You treated him with justice. Now, some of you might choose another option. You might choose, for whatever reason, to treat the kid with the second option is mercy. And justice is giving someone what they deserve. Mercy is giving them less than they deserve. You don't give them the full punishment. Mercy is you know what someone deserves, but you give them a little less. You soften the blow. You take a little bit of the sting away. So you say to this kid, son, I'm not going to call the police because I don't want you to get all cross with the law right now, with everything that's going on in your family. But I'm going to call your parents. I'm going to establish what the walls cost, what the furniture costs, what the property costs, and you're going to pay. Now, if you did that, you would be not just, but you'd be merciful. Because you're not giving what the full penalty of the law says. He should be grateful because you could have been just. Now it's possible that you might choose a third option. Uh, hit the pause button here. What I'm not saying is this is how to use all disciplinary action against a, a, a child. Okay, So I'm not saying this is the route you always have to go. Sometimes justice is needed. But the third option is scandalous. It is high risk. It could blow up in your face. He could fully take advantage of it. And that is, you know what it is. The third option is to treat the kid with grace. And you might go to him and say, son, you fouled up. You destroyed our house. But I'm not going to call the police because I don't want you to be crossed with the law, with everything going on with your family. You know what? I'm not even sure I want you to get into a whole lot of trouble especially with that situation. And further, the house that's trashed and the furniture, those things can be replaced. We can pay for those, and, and I'm going to pay for that. We're paying for that. It's going to cost us. We're going to absorb the cost. But how about you and I get into my car, and we'll find a place where we can sit down, and we can have a bite to eat, and I can find out a little bit about who you are and what's going on in your life and what the future might hold for you because I do see a future for you, would you do that with me? And some of you were saying right now, that is not smart. That kid's going to do it again to somebody else's house. And, and he might. He might. That's the risk of grace. He might go out and do the same thing the next day. But what is equally possible that God is betting on for you it is equally possible that one day you realize, oh my gosh, what I deserve. What I deserve. And the manifestation of scandalous, undeserved favor will touch that boy at the deepest part of his soul. It might be that when that kid gets into your car and sits down and has a sandwich and he's got someone looking in his eyes who unconditionally loves him, who is unconditionally reaching out to him, someone who doesn't have to build into him, someone who's interested in him, who wants to talk about his future and his potential and what his life might be someday, that it's possible that that kid might go home and he might lay down his head, his head on his pillow at night and look completely at himself differently, somebody who didn't have to cares for me. Somebody treated me in a very different way, and I want to open up my heart to that. If you understand that illustration, I'm telling you, that's where God wants to get you. No, what I deserve? What I deserve? 
and what I'm given in Christ. My past is forgiven. My future is secure. My present is empowered by his Holy Spirit. Are you kidding me? If you understand that, you understand why we believe in Jesus. And we don't have Santa Claus theology anymore. Amen? Amen? I'm going to pray. And then we're going to come out and, and, and lead you to the Lord's table. Where you say, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that would be a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, and my all. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Christmas. Where we are brought to the Christ. We love old Saint Nick. He did, he did quite a few good things, but he's not our savior. Jesus is. And now as a body, we die to the law that we might live for the body of Christ. And everybody who wants this said, amen. God willing, see you next week, Southbrook. See you next week.